Mike Sullivan's been guilty of misprioritizing, misjudging, misassigning players over the course of his now lengthy NHL career, but it isn't always his fault when something doesn't work out. Good morning to you. Good Monday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Pirates that I hope you'll check out as well. Alex Nylander signed with the Toronto Marlies yesterday. Not to be confused with that other Toronto team that has a nickname starting with M. It was a one-year AHL contract. That means not a two-way contract. That means not an NHL contract in any way, shape, or form. And that means that Nylander, fresh off allegedly erupting as an NHL presence with the Blue Jackets after the Penguins traded him for Emil Bemstrom, he had 11 goals and four assists in 23 games. 11 goals in 23 games. Hat trick in there and did all kinds of great stuff offensively. And then the summer came along. Nylander could have been a restricted free agent. The Blue Jackets declined to make a qualifying offer. That made him a total free agent. After which none of the 32 teams in the league thought to take his 11 goals in 23 games seriously. Now, there's a lot that could be said about that, not least of which is that, you know, maybe everybody will be wrong. Maybe Nylander will get a chance to get called up to that other Toronto team, play alongside his brother William, and show everybody. He's 26 years old. He's not 36. There might still be something there. However, the first thing that I think about with something like this is that in the NHL in 2024, you had better be able to at least pretend to care about your own end. Daniel Sprong puts up goals at a pretty healthy pace in the NHL. Couldn't get himself anything more than an NHL close to minimum deal just now. There are others. No one wants a one-way player. No one wants someone who can just put up whatever it is, 20, 25 goals, as valuable as those goals are. If they've additionally got the metrics that dismiss them as being helpful contributors to your cause, time was you had to sniff those guys out. You had to, you know, have some old school coach or scout or whoever evaluating and watching somebody behind the play. Now, everybody and everything is getting dissected, including the film, including the film that shows all 200 by 85 of ice. They're shooting film like this now in training camp settings, in scrimmages, in preseason, in practices. They want to see who's invested in doing what. They look for the littlest of little things. Which leads me to the second thing that I think about all this, and that swings me all the way back to Sullivan. This episode is brought to you by Bet Online, your number one source for all your summer sports needs this season from Major League Baseball, golf, NHL, NBA playoffs. Get the latest odds and lines, including all team matchups, player props, odds on just about everything that's out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. I remember speaking on this program around the time that Nylander was going on his rampage in Columbus. Give it time. There are reasons that he's developed the reputation that he has. Even if he continues scoring, he's not going to be seen as valuable. Whereas most, not all, but most of the feedback that came in this direction was that this somehow had something to do with Sullivan not wanting to play young players, even though Nylander, again, currently is 26. 
or that he doesn't want to give new guys a chance on the top six because all of his top six guys are permanently ingrained. Or, and this one's always my favorite, his system doesn't allow that player to flourish. Whereas Nylander goes to play in the Columbus system, the Columbus system, under a coach who got fired like a month later and just developed this Midas touch around the net as a result. It's all silliness. It's all, I have something that I think about a certain person, and I'm going to find whatever I can to throw at them. That's the approach. It's kind of like politics, to be honest with you. In the Sullivan system, what he values the most out of the winger position, but doubly so, in the top six setting is being able to get in on the four check and then to create once you win that puck. We talked about that quite a bit as it relates to Drew O'Connor, but it really relates to everybody who's put into that position with the Penguins. You will also recall that when Nylander came up, and you're going to know what I'm talking about, the first time he came up and he was placed on a line with Evgeny Malkin, there was some kind of visible chemistry between the two that lasted, I don't know, but maybe two or three games, but it had a very real look to it. There was a sense for where the other was, what Gino wanted from him. He would deliver. He was even shooting on occasion, which he didn't do in any of his subsequent call-ups for whatever reason. And that's to say that he was actually a pretty good fit for the Sullivan system as long as he was invested. The problem with Nylander, and Sullivan talked about this before the first time he ever came to the NHL, is that he needed to be, what was the term he used? Yeah, he said he needs to have a more consistent motor. Okay, whenever you hear Sullivan say that, and Nylander's not the first one he said that about, and he won't be the last. Whenever you hear that from him, All he's saying is he's not conscientious without the puck, and I can't manage that, and I refuse to instill that at the NHL level. If you don't want to get to the NHL level badly enough to do something as simple, basic, and controllable as, you know, being responsible without the puck, then I don't even want you here in the first place. And guess what? Just a short time later, you had 31 other franchises agreeing in the most powerful way possible. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from Ethan, who says, DK, would trading someone like Ricard Raquel for a certified top six winger be worth it? When I go through the Penguins' top six, as I see them, Raquel sticks out just because he's inconsistent. If Drew O'Connor, Michael Bunting, and Brian Rust are certified top sixers, wouldn't it be good to go get someone to fill Raquel's spot, who's very good in that spot? The You're suggesting, Ethan, the type of trade that almost never happens, not just in the NHL, in sports, you don't see, I'll put it into other sports terminology just to make that point alone, you don't see someone trade a veteran left-handed starting pitcher for a veteran left-handed starting pitcher. What you almost always see is, well, we're going to move this wide receiver for that outside cornerback, as the Steelers, by the way, did in trading Deontay Johnson to Carolina for Dante Jackson. These are the types of exchanges that happen. That has a lot to do, I believe, with general manager egos. Uh, No one wants to fess up that, well, your left-handed starting pitcher is better than mine, And if I already have one of these, why do I need yours? As such, trades are made based on positional need, uh, a certain facet of the team that's needed to be upgraded, as, for example, the Pirates needing offense right now. But what you're putting forth there is you don't believe that Raquel is a top six winger, but you'd like to get somebody else's top six winger. And 
that's no. Okay. If you want to do something like that, you can discuss it, but you'd better start by sweetening the pot. You got to throw in a, a significant draft pick. You've got to throw in a prospect of some kind, because unless you're dealing with the Edmonton Oilers, you're going to be dealing with intelligent people. You're going to be dealing with people that know what they're doing and who are going to see right through what your mindset is. And yes, in parentheses, I know the Oilers have a new GM, but that's a sickening subject unto itself. I'll save that maybe for another day, end parentheses. As I see it, Raquel is a top six winger. Raquel, when he's on, makes a lot of things happen beyond just the goals and the assists that he'll produce. Also, for what it's worth, if you go over the back of his figurative hockey card, you're not going to see a lot of inconsistency. You're going to see the opposite. You're going to see that he's pretty predictable when it comes to his plain and simple points output. What happened this past season to Raquel was really a career first, where he started off just, he was playing so well. I know that's not what you thought I was going to say, because he didn't score in his first 19 games, but he was playing so, so well and just couldn't buy one. Even the the caliber of the shots that he was taking when he'd get these quality scoring chances were like, they were 95 percenters, I thought, off of his blade. And it would hit somebody, it would bang the pipe, goaltender would make a ridiculous save. You remember that. Then he got hurt. Then he came back still carrying that zero. Then he started to squeeze his shaft to sawdust and it got really bad. So I don't know that I'd label him for that. I really don't. I also don't know him to be the kind who would get lazy or fat off the new contract or anything like that. So he's going to be a really interesting case for me this coming season. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We're going to do another one of these tomorrow. Tomorrow.